Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning to you all and a happy new year. It's great to see so many of you out um, uh, on this new year's morning, particularly after uh, what I took was a long uh, Georgia football game last night. Um, I was well asleep because if LSU is not involved, then it doesn't really matter to me. But nevertheless, uh, great to see you all. And it's been sort of interesting to have Christmas on a Sunday and then New Year's on a Sunday. Uh, but next year, we can look forward to having Christmas Eve on a Sunday. So those of you who've always wanted to go to church twice in one day will have your opportunity um, next year. So we'll be training uh, in advance for that. So stay tuned um, uh, for uh, 2023. So uh, last week, I preached on uh, the given text, what is known as John's, the prologue to John's gospel. And in that, I talked about how the Jews had interacted with the surrounding philosophical and religious thought for thousands of years. And this cross-pollination, as it were, culminated in the audacious claim by John in his gospel that Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, through the incarnation, had become, in fact, the incarnate word, the logos, the, the, the unifying principle of the world, the embodiment and the animating and sustaining force behind all creation. In the beginning was the Word, writes John, the Logos, and the Word was God, and the Word, I mean, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, this audacious claim that the only true God that exists, which is audacious in itself, that not only was this one God uh, uh, existent, but also had taken on flesh and had become human to enter into our humanity, into time and space that he had created so that we could be redeemed. And this is the importance, as we talked about, of the incarnation. I mean, the ramifications of Jesus' birth for the world. To save us, he assumed our bodies, adopted our limitations, accepted our condition, clothed himself in our weakness, and suffered death for our sake. We are all born sinners, says the Bible. But through Jesus, we can all be redeemed. It's the amazing claim of this gospel message on the world. As Paul, the apostle, says in Romans 5, he says, Therefore, just as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. He says, see, this is no small thing we're talking about, the incarnation with relationship to our faith. And we rightly celebrate it and marvel at it in a great feast day, Christmas morning, year after year. But we don't stop there. You see, because as fascinating as prof and as profound as the incarnation is, it's part of a larger story. It's the beginning, as it were, of a, of a complex narrative and an even more, even more profound, more audacious claim upon the world. One that I mentioned on our Christmas Eve sermon just a week or so ago. And that, namely, is that it's true. That this is the claim on the world. That God exists. He has become incarnate in his Son. He has died for the sake of sinners. And that all who believe in him will have eternal life. This is the audacious claim. And Jesus, in his birth, begins the propagation, I mean, the promulgation of this claim to the ends of the earth. And that by this truth, so would his church proclaim, all other truths find their bearing and direction. And without it, the world is left in darkness. People are left to condemned to wander around without meaning, purpose, or plan. This is what all of the great sort of existential philosophers of the 19th and 20th century saw. That people are thrown into the world, Gewürfenheit is what they would say, thrown into the world and chained, forced to make some sense of this. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? God knew this plight. He sent his son to redeem those cursed to that wandering through his son. You see, both of our readings today that we heard, the one from Galatians and the one from Matthew, point to an aspect of this, this reorienting, this, this grounding uh, reality of the claim of Jesus on the world. First, at his birth, as we hear in Matthew, with the arrival of the Magi, the kings, and then through the work and witness of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Galatian church. 
Now, we'll have the opportunity over the next few weeks leading up to Lit to walk through the season of Epiphany. You know, Christmas tide, technically right now, we're about to enter into the season of Epiphany. And so we'll be talking a little bit about this word Epiphany that has been attributed to our season in the church calendar. And within the church context, it refers to the, uh, the revelation of God to the Gentiles. This Friday, January 6th, we'll be celebrating the day of the Epiphany, this revelation with a a traditional bonfire, which will signify the light of Christ to the world. So, but beyond that, this word Epiphany um, means a a variety of other things that have ramifications for the claim of Jesus on the world, his arrival, his appearance. The word Epiphany can mean a, a sudden manifestation or perception of the essential nature or meaning of something. The epiphany of Jesus in the world brings about a sudden realization of what is actually true about life. It can mean an intuitive grasp of reality through something such as an event that's usually simple yet striking, like, for instance, the birth of a child. It can be an illuminating discovery, realization, or disclosure. You see, in this context, the entire season of Epiphany can be seen as a celebration and a reflection on the meaning of what Jesus' coming to the world means for all of humanity. Because the claim is that he is the person from whom all previous and subsequent days and events find their reference and meaning. And this is the argument of the Bible. This has been the argument and proclamation of the church. You see, King Herod from Matthew, knew the stakes of this claim. We heard in Matthew, because when the wise men from the east, from the Magi, arrived looking for the long-foretold king, the one that they had been searching the stars, awaiting for the, the, um, a- the astrological sign to lead them to this birth, when they came to the king, what did Herod say? Well, Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Well, we know that that was disingenuous, to put it lightly, because Herod was so disquieted by this announcement that the true king had been born that he went on to try to kill all of the boys two years and under in the entire region so somehow he could remain enthroned. Because Herod knew that if this baby were born to be king, then his reign and that of his descendants would be no longer. You see, it's the same then as it is now. Many unbelieving people, like then as now, and also throughout history, have actually evinced a greater sense of the stakes that Jesus' claim on the world are making than oftentimes many people in the church. When many unbelieving people hear in the proclamation that God has, uh, what God has done in Christ to save, When many unbelieving people read and hear what the Bible says, well, then they realize that this is all or nothing. That either this baby must die or I will not be enthroned anymore on the throne of my life. If this is true, then everything changes. Herod knew that. Unbelieving people know that. They simply reject it. And the church doesn't sort of have an awesome appreciation of that at at our own peril. You see, the birth of Jesus claims the world. The proclamation of the the gospel forces a decision. And wherever it is heard, it can never then be unheard. It can be rejected. It can be mocked. It can be dismissed. But you can't unhear the proclamation that Jesus Christ came to save you, a sinner, and that but for his blood, you will not be saved. You can't unhear that. Herod knew that. Unbelieving people know that. The church has proclaimed that, and the world will never be the same. After this proclamation is made, people live the rest of their lives in rejection or acceptance, rebellion or submission. See, the Apostle Paul knew this. The Apostle Paul famously was a rebel, rejecting the lordship of Christ, persecuting the body, his church, and all of a sudden knocked off his, church, uh, his horse and dramatically reversed, repented by Jesus himself and sent into the world to proclaim this amazing message. He describes the either or as either being enslaved or free. 
He writes to his church in Galatia, So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Now we're about to start next Wednesday, not this Wednesday, but next, a six-week Bible study on Galatians. So I invite all of you to come to that because we will dig deeply into this amazing letter of Paul. And we'll look at more of the context and the exegesis of this particular passage in gen- uh, 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 specifically. But for this sermon, I want to focus on one part of the reading that highlights the universal application of Paul's argument that was as radical then as it is today. We hear him saying to the Christian people, the church in Galatia, he writes this, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Now what could this possibly mean? Well, I can assure you, it does not mean that Paul is advocating the abolition of all distinctions between people within the church. There remain then, as now, gender differences, ethnic differences, socioeconomic differences in the church, just as they existed both within and without the church. The point that Paul makes here, though, is two Christian people, unlike outside of faith in Christ Jesus, we know because of his death for sinners, We know because at the foot of the cross all ground is equal and level, we know that all of these identity markers, as it were, are the penultimate, the secondary concerns of life, not the ultimate. Christians know not only what men and women are, but why we are separated and how we can be reconciled, namely through Christ. We know not only that ethnic and cultural distinctions exist, but how they are to be ranked in order of importance, namely not the most important among brothers and sisters in Christ. We know that socioeconomic disparity and social hierarchies exist, but how they are to be handled in the body of Christ. We, the church, know namely that they are held in the proper relation to our fundamental blood-bought unity in the Lord. You see, this is not something that is a given outside of the church. This is not something that is a unity that is easy to find outside of a confession of the shared blood of Christ for sinners. Look around us today. All we see outside the church are people clamoring for their rights, my identity, my sense of self. This is not freedom says Paul. This is slavery. Slavery to the self. The very thing that the existential philosopher said would be the plight of human existence. Make something of yourself. Find some meaning in who you are essentially. Paul knew that that was slavery. We had been freed from that because we are now adopted as sons and daughters of Christ. Jesus, in Jesus, there is a unity that transcends all of these penultimate and secondary realities and has, in fact, however imperfect and beset by sin, death, and the devil, nevertheless has, in fact, created one body, one people, one redeemed, united people of God. You see, Paul argues that without Jesus, without the coming of faith in him, without and through the preaching of the gospel that he calls these the elemental principles of the world. We are, we are going to be enslaved back to the worship of these elemental principles. Our gender, our ethnicity, our financial, our socioeconomic status. These are the only things outside of Christ whereby we can find meaning. So it's unsurprising that people look to those very things to sort of shape their lives. So we're the enslaved to these things, Paul says. You're enslaved to your your pedigree. You're enslaved to the envy of those who have more. You are enslaved to to, to the idea about yourself that you are pursuing at all costs because what else is there? Nothing until that baby was born and the gospel began to be proclaimed to the ends of the earth. You see, this was a state of the world without Jesus. Paul knew this. It was life lived under the echoing voice of God without his promise. 
We are commanded and demanded to make something of ourselves, to be people, to find meaning and purpose, and yet without his revealed promise, then we are adrift, we're lost, we're wandering in the darkness. Remember in Genesis, after sin enters the world, what do we hear? It says, the Lord God was walking in the cool of the garden, and he calls out, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I was, I was afraid and naked and ashamed, so I hid from you. See, this is the picture of the human person before the claim, the call of God. Where are you? We're thrown into the world, and we hear this instinctually. Where are you? Where did you come from? Who are you? What did you stood for? What is your name? We hear this, and yet we are ashamed and naked and afraid, and so we, we hide. This thundering voice of God from the unknown continues to drive people behind trees. Well, think about the voice of God similarly after Cain murders his brother Abel. Cain, after the blood-stained hands, hears the thundering voice of God, What have you done, Cain? And these two echoing, thundering questions of God, Where are you and what have you done, continue to reverberate in the souls of every human and continue to drive us to the captivity of these elementary principles of the world. What have you done? Well, look at the things I've done. Where are you? Well, well I'm, I'm a person of this status, of this, of this position. I'm, I must have made something of myself, we cry. Paul saw that as slavery, the very slavery from which Jesus came to redeem us. You see, the Bible understands this captivity and argues that until a promise from God was made, that people would be constrained and confined to just that captivity. But then the promise was given to Abraham, called out of Ur, called out of the worship of false idols. The promise given to him that someday from your nation, a savior would come that would be a blessing not only to the Jews, but to the entire world. That was the very promise that was born on that Christmas morning that Herod was afraid of, that Paul was convicted by, and that has been preached to the ends of the earth and has changed the world forever. With the birth of Jesus, the epiphany, the revelation of God had come, and the world will never be the same again. Listen to Paul. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you, know, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You see, Paul knew, and Christian people know, that we are not those people taken out of the world. We're not promised, or even should expect, that we would be better than everyone else, holier or more righteous than everyone else. We were certainly not promised that we would be spared from the ravages of sin, death, and the devil. None of those are promises given to Christian people. However, we have been given the Spirit by whom we cry out to the now known God, not as impersonal force, not as the cosmic fate of the world, not as the, um, the luck that might befall me, but as a loving Father, Abba, who hears us knows us, sustains us, even in the midst of this present darkness. That's the promise of God for his people. You see, this is the epiphany of God, the coming of Jesus into the world. And that's why, for those who come to faith in him, for those who come to see Jesus as their Savior, then nothing will ever be the same again. Because in his death, they see their death. In his resurrection, they see their realized promise that someday, as we pray in great expectant hope, we will be raised to new life and see our Savior face to face. You know, every time I come to this reading about the Magi, I'm haunted by the closing refrain of Matthew. Perhaps you were, too. 
uh, at the refrain of this reading, when we hear Matthew write, And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Just, I love the end of that, that they departed to their own country by another way. You see, this has rightly been understood as a succinct allusion to the fact that these magi, these kings, having been confronted with the long-awaited birth of the long-foretold king, they would return home, yes, but as changed men, as people who could no longer unsee or unknown or unhear what they had experienced and beheld there in the manger. They would have to go home, yes, but by an entirely other way. See, T.S. Eliot, great English poet, 20th century, um, in his poem, The Journey of the Magi, if you, I commend it to you, picks up on this. And um, it's only three stanzas long, but I'm not gonna read all three, because, but the last one is a recollection one assumes by the time one of these kings had made it back to his home by another way. So the last stanza goes like this. All this was a long time ago, I remember, and I would do it again, but set down. This set down, this. Were we led all that way for birth or death? There was a birth, certainly. We had evidence and no doubt. I had seen birth and death, but I thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We return to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. I love this line, they're no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. We hear in that the echoes of the, of the great saints down through the church history. The Apostle Paul saying, I, I long to be united with Christ, and yet as I'm here in the body, I labor on behalf of him for your sakes. You hear the, the prayers of the faithful people who, when confronted with the risen Lord, know that this is not their home. In this old dispensation among the alien uh, people clutching their alien gods is simply a reminder that someday, our final security, which has been given to us through the hope of the resurrection, will be realized in Christ, and we will, in fact, see him face to face. You see, I love this poem. It's a beautiful and poetic rendering of this incredible message of the Bible to the world, that in and through Jesus, nothing will ever be the same. He's the source of our being, the meaning of our lives, the security of our future, and all of these are given their structure and security in Jesus. You see, our hope, unlike sort of the mystics, our hopes are hung decidedly in time and space. On a baby, on a cross, in an empty tomb, this is where our hope has been grounded. And through that grounding, we are given his mercy and his grace, new every morning, to address our fears, to address our failings in light of the fact that Jesus has revealed our ultimate destination. And therefore, we are now, as we will say, bold to pray our Father who art in heaven, because we are now no longer slaves, but sons. And if a son, then an heir through God. Thanks be to God. Amen.